So after reading the blog post, you may be thinking to yourself, you know what? How the heck did I live without Webpack? And if you were thinking that, that's pretty good because this video is going to show you how to get set up with Webpack in your Flask app. So step number one will be to open up your requirements.txt file and just dropping in Flask Webpack. At the moment, the current version is 002, but you might want to check GitHub first. Then, like usual, we'll just pip install the requirements file and we're done with that. Next up, depending on how your app is set up, you may have an extensions file where you just import every extension that you have and then you just instantiate an instance of it down here. That's pretty cool. So next up is the app file. I currently use the app factory pattern and I have a function register extensions and that function just init's the extension on the app. Okay, so now that takes care of installing Flask Webpack, but now you need to configure it. So we'll check out the settings file, and we only need to set one setting, and that's the Webpack manifest path. And this is the manifest.json file that gets spit out by Webpack. Well, Flask Webpack reads this file in, so we need to tell it where it's at. It could be anywhere. For me, I just like putting it in a build folder and then the manifest.json file. So you can see that over here. This is the root, here's the build folder, there's the manifest.json. Now, we can't really read it too well in this editor, so what I did was I loaded it up on a pretty printer. So we can see that there are two main keys. We have the assets key and the public path key. The public path key is just showing where the uh, assets are going to be served from on the Webpack dev server. We're not going to have to touch that. So the other one is the assets key that has a list of every single asset in your app. Now the key for each one of these is the relative file name and the value is also the relative file name but you can see there is a random string here and that is the MD5 of the file name. Now, if we go to our templates here, you'll see that there is a JavaScript tag on the bottom here, and there's also a stylesheet tag. These have both have been added by Flask Webpack, and there's also a third one called Asset URL for, where the idea is you can pass in the name of the file, and it does a lookup here, and it produces the value over here. Now, that's basically all that Flask Webpack does. The rest of the stuff is all Webpack. And we're going to get into that in one second. But first, we are going to run the Webpack dev server. Now, in my case, what I've done is I wrote a script that just runs everything in one shot. It sets up the Unicorn server, a couple Celery workers, it loads up Docker for Postgres and Redis, and it also loads the Webpack dev server. That's what all the spam is here. You can see it's, it's done quite a bit of stuff in about three and a half seconds, which is pretty cool. So now if we go to the app, we can see everything is loaded with our assets. And if we view the source code, you can see that that CSS tag from before, it's now been output as that. And if we click on this link, it'll just be the fully compiled CSS, which is nice and all but let's see what happens when we want to edit something. Let's say we want to make these links some vomit-inducing green color instead of blue. So in my app, I have an assets folder and the style sheets folder, and you can see that I am using SAS here, and there's quite a bit. There's about 60K worth. Now I'm going to open up the utils file, and let's say we'll change this to that green color, we'll save it, we'll come back to here, and you can see the links are green. But also you'll see some activity here from the asset server. In about 400 milliseconds it updated the SAS for us, and that's pretty good considering I am recording a 1080p video right now, usually this is about 200 milliseconds. So this green is getting me sick, let's go back to the blue, and we'll go back, and we're back to blue. So everything is working assets wise, that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's take a peek at the Webpack config. In my case, I have a config folder, and the Webpack config is sitting in there. So this file isn't too long, but there is quite a bit of stuff to go through. So we'll go through it from the top. The root asset path is where the assets are located 
on your project. In my case, it's in the cat watch folder and then in assets subfolder. This could be named anything you want. It could be placed anywhere you want. Just make sure it lines up with this path. So the next important thing is the context of where all these commands are going to be ran from. Since I had the Webpack config in a config folder, I want everything to be ran in the context of one directory back from that. Now, next up are the entries. These are called chunks, and they result in the file name being output in the end. So you can have as many chunks as you want. In my case, I just have one for JavaScript and one for CSS. Each chunk is going to be written based on the contents of what's in this array. So for the CSS file, we have the main SAS file, and then we have a couple vendor CSS files. In the Java, JavaScript case, there's only this one entry.js file. And it's not like I'm sitting there like a clown writing 400,000 lines of JavaScript in one file. I'm actually using the common, <coughs> the common JS system to require in the files. So if we go to this entry.js, you can see that I'm just requiring in files and then I'm just using them. So for a quick recap on this, if you've never seen this before, let's say that we have this pluralize function, which is pretty stupid at the moment, but it works. You pass in a word and you pass in the count. And if the count is greater than one, it just adds an S to the word. So the magic is really at the bottom here where I just go module exports and then the function name. <clears throat> so we can see in this file, up top, we just require in the pluralize function, and then down here, we use it. It's basically very similar to importing a package in Python. But this video isn't about that, so let's move on. Next up, we have the output. So up until now, we've been just running the dev server, and it hasn't written any files to disk. But if you want to serve your assets in a production environment, you're going to have to write them to disk. So let's build them now. Now, this is a shortcut that I wrote, run assets build. But in the end, it just runs this webpack command here. And you can see it just did a whole bunch of stuff. It just uh, basically profiled everything and wrote them all out. If we go to this build folder, now we have this public folder, which matches here. And all of our assets are here, and they're all tagged with their MD5, and everything is all happy and good. So next up is this public path. You don't have to change this at all, but you can if you want. It's basically just where the assets are going to be served from. Um, file name and chunk name. It's basically just formatting the file like it's output. So if we take a look at this, we can see that there's the name of the file, followed by a period, followed by the MD5, and then the extension of the file. It just matches up here. And the chunk file is basically the same thing. In Webpack, in, blah, in Webpack terms, a chunk is this, and a chunk is that. Anything in this entry setup is a chunk. So next up, we have the resolve section. And the short version of that is it lets you do things like require a coupon instead of require a coupon.js because we have it defined over here. Now, next up are loaders. Loaders are pretty cool because they allow you to search for some type of file extension, let's say .js, and then apply some type of functionality to it. In this case, Babel loader. Now, before we go into what each of these do, you have to realize that these loaders are dependencies of the project. They're not built directly into Webpack. So all of this is being set up with Node.js and Node.js has a package.json file. It's very similar to Python's requirements.txt file. So we just have a list of dependencies here with their versions. If you were to type npm install, it would install them all, and then you're good to go. So I'm not gonna go into specifics on every single loader here because if you were to Google for file loader or Babel loader, you'll find plenty of documentation for each one. But the beauty of this system is everything is plug and play. So if you don't want, let's say, SAS, you can just delete this and you're good to go. You don't have to worry about modifying the Flask Webpack extension or anything like that. In fact, that extension only cares about the manifest file that's output by this config. So I really like how everything is separated like that. If you want to use less or stylus or maybe you want to use CoffeeScript or TypeScript, 
There's loaders for all of those things and about a hundred more. So we'll quickly go through a couple of these like Babel Loader. It allows you to write ES6 JavaScript instead of ES5. Now ES6 allows you to do things like write proper classes. Uh, there's better string concatenation. There's a whole bunch of advantages. So we also have image optimizations going on. Images get compressed when you do the build. We have stuff for fonts and music files, HTML, Markdown. If you're using any type of like client-side templating or maybe you're using React, there's some really great React support too. Now, next up are plugins. Plugins are basically just some code that gets ran against whatever assets you have. Like for instance, the dedupe one will just remove duplicate selectors and uglify JS will just make your JS ugly. Now, the very last one is the Manifest Revision plugin. This one's pretty important. It's a plugin that I wrote, and what it does is it actually exports that manifest file. And there is an important setting for it too called Ignore Paths. So in my case, I want to ignore everything except for the images because the style sheets and the scripts are already being processed up here by the chunks. The fonts are already versioned from the vendor, so the only thing left are images. So we're just saying, you know what, ignore everything except for the images. Now, as a side here, this plugin will work for Ruby on Rails as well. It's not just made for Flask or Flask Webpack. And it's actually been designed to support other formats. Like if you want it to work with a different framework, you can basically write about 10 lines of JavaScript and then it'll work. So that basically sums up everything about Webpack and using it with Flask. If you want to check out this CatWatch app, it's on my GitHub profile, and all that stuff is listed below in the description. Okay, thanks for listening.